I'd like to start by uh, describing my surroundings. I'm at home sitting on my couch, surrounded by decorative cushions. I'm a Filipino woman with dark hair that's pulled back and bangs. Um, and I'm wearing a dark turtleneck that is a plum color. My name is Nadine Villasine Feldman. I am the Director of Programming at Myzeum. And as the Director of Programming, it is my work and our work here at Myzeum to consider what it means to make space and hold space for the diverse stories and histories of Toronto. And because all of our stories are ultimately deeply rooted in our relationship to the land we live on, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the history of this land as the ancestral homelands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. And I'd like to honor their care and stewardship of this land from time immemorial and recognize that we benefit from the caretaking efforts of those who have come before us as we live and gather on the land, albeit at a distance today. Um, for me, recognizing this history challenges me to think about what my responsibilities are as a first generation immigrant to honor the Dish With One Spoon Covenant, which predates settler treaties and reminds all of us, settler, immigrant, newcomer, those forcibly brought by the transatlantic slave trade and the diverse indigenous peoples who live here today of our individual and collective responsibility to develop and maintain a healthy relationship with the land. Um, remembering the history of this land also challenges me to think about the settler impacts on our relationship to the land and to one another. How does this history affect how we tell our stories? How does it inform which stories we choose to tell? And of course, as a programmer, I'm inspired to think about how the stories we share today might contribute to the writing of relations amongst ourselves and with the land and serve the gen seven generations that follow us. We are very honored to have with us tonight six storytellers who will be sharing with you their present day lived experiences as disabled and chronically ill youth and young adults as they navigate a city that according to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act uh, aims to be barrier free by 2025. Um, we have had the absolute pleasure of working with and learning from Ophira Kaloff, who is the curator of this two-part series, as well as the wonderful people at the Real Abilities Film Festival of Toronto, Miles Nadal JCC, who are our program partners. Um, and I'd also like to give a special thank you um, to Deaf Spectrum, who uh, are our promotional partners for this event. So just before we begin, um, just a little bit more of a description about the program this evening. Um, this program will be one hour and 15 minutes long, so please feel free to take breaks as you need them. Um, and the stories shared uh, tonight will be a mix of pre-recorded videos as well as live storytelling. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll finish the program um, with a question and answer period at the end. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass things on um, to Livia Mendelssohn from Real Abilities Film Festival Toronto and the Miles Nadal JCC. Thank you, Nadine. Um, what a pleasure it is to be with you. Uh, I want to thank the whole Myzeum team. This has been such a wonderful, collaborative, generative partnership, um, and we have so enjoyed working with you and look forward to doing so again. Um, I'm also gonna describe myself. I am a white woman with brown short hair and brown eyes wearing a navy uh, dress with white polka dots. And I'm seated up against a uh, brown headboard. Um, and I'm so pleased to be with you all tonight. Um, I'm the Director of Accessibility and Inclusion at the Miles Nadal JCC in downtown Toronto. Many of you know us. And um, I really want to shout out our Youth Advisory uh, Accessibility Committee, many of whom are here tonight. Um, the seeds of this project in many ways came from their desire to both hear stories about uh, disability history, uh, which we were very lucky to hear from some amazing storytellers uh, last week and to, to um, have a place to have the stories and the issues that are ongoing right now uh, be raised and explored together. Uh, I'm also the artistic director of the Real Abilities Toronto Film Festival. And uh, just to let you all know, our festival is coming up in May and we have year round events. 
uh, focused on deaf and disability culture. Um, so do check that out. Uh, I want to, before I introduce the amazing Ophira Khalif, I also want to um, thank uh, Grace Smith, uh, who from our team was really instrumental in putting this event together. Um, Ophira, turn on your camera so I can embarrass you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with uh, the wonderful Ophira Kaloff. Um, she is one of my very favorite people to work with. And um, many of you know her as a theater artist and a curator uh, from her one woman show at uh, Next Stage, literally Titanium, and from her multi award winning uh, fringe ensemble show, uh, Generally Hospital. Um, she also is the co comedy coordinator uh, for the Real Abilities Film Festival and just an all round delight and um, curated this uh, evening with great care, uh, as she always does, uh, and enormous empathy. And uh, this evening could not be in better hands. Uh, so thank you, Ophira. I'm going to pass it over to you. I mean, and now I have to speak when I have emotions. Um, thank you so much, Liv. Uh, thank you to Nadine as well. And the whole the whole team, everyone who's been involved with this project. Well, we're at the beginning of the night and it also feels like the end of, of this really incredible experience. So I just want to put that appreciation out there to everyone. Um, I'm Ophira, and to, I'm going to give a bit of a visual description of myself. Uh, I'm a white, fat, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish human. Um, I'm disabled, and I usually use a power wheelchair, but today I'm seated on my couch, propped up by a whole bunch of pillows, and I am wearing burgundy, fairly dramatic cat eye glasses, a white and navy blue neck brace, I have very short, dark hair and I'm wearing a black shirt. And behind me, there's a purple and gold fabric wall hanging. Um, that's just adding some texture to the situation. I'm so incredibly honored to be here today and get to present this program. Um, these storytellers are incredible and I already am feeling all of the warmth from the chat, and I'm just really happy to be here with you all. Um, during last week's event, uh, which was part one of this series, we delved into stories from disabled elders, activists, artists, and frankly, legends who grew up in the 1960s to the 1980s. Um, and we learned a bit about the transition from institutionalization to independent living models and the huge amount of advocacy and community organizing that went into establishing the start of rights-based policy for disability that started to come into play in the 70s. And as you heard, today we're going to hear stories from the present, sort of taking stock of what the landscape for disabled youth is like today, you know, what's changed, what stayed the same, and to start to reflect on what that means going forward into the future as well. So to bring us into the present, I'm going to quickly chat about some of the shifts that took place over the past few decades. And I just wanna say, if you wanna learn more, I'm gonna move fairly quickly, but there's gonna be some links popping up uh, in the comments if you wanna kind of delve through on, uh, on your own. Um, and those links will also be provided after the event. So first off, the AODA, which is the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, this act came into being through a bumpy road and lots of community advocacy in 2005. And its goal is to make Ontario fully accessible by 2025, which is four years from now. Um, we're not exactly on track to achieving that, um, but the goal is, um, is great to have. Um, another thing is Ontario's 2001 policy and guidelines on disability and the duty to accommodate. That was a huge step forward on paper. It outlined that people with disabilities have to be accommodated to the point of undue hardship, which was defined pretty rigorously. Um, it's quite strict, that standard. 
The thing is that in practice, it's complaint based. So it often becomes the job of disabled people to fight discrimination after it's happened instead of kind of making sure that it doesn't happen in the first place. And before going forward, Further, I just want to acknowledge that this year in particular has been quite a rough one for a lot of folks with disabilities. Um, the narratives and policies around COVID have really sent the message that the lives of disabled and chronically ill people are seen as less valuable. And last week, a new piece of legislation was voted through here in Canada, which kind of emphasized that message too. So it's been a bit of a rough go all around um, and I kind of want to hold that space, but also say that that's part of why I'm finding it so incredibly meaningful to be here today and to have this program sharing narratives and art from disabled folks who are building that space each and every day. So to dive a little deeper, I had the chance to talk with Sam Walsh a disability studies scholar, activist. She's the director of service at the Independent Living Center of Waterloo, uh, Waterloo Region, and was one of our research consultants for this project. And I just wanted to ask her to give a little bit of context about what this means for youth in Toronto today. So here's a little piece that condenses down some of what we chatted about. Samantha Walsh, could you please give a visual description of yourself? So I am female presenting. I look like I'm in my mid-30s, but also am in my mid-30s. I have brown hair. It's tied up in a bobby pin right now. My eyes are green and my uh, skin is pale. And because it's COVID, I need my hair dyed which means that my brown hair is a contrasting of super hot black roots with um, brown underneath. How would you describe the current landscape for disabled youth in Toronto? Financially, the city is quite inaccessible right now. Even if you don't have a disability, youth are struggling to move out of their parents' homes. That is an interesting place to start because for folks with disabilities, specifically youth with disabilities, it um, hampers the individuation process of leaving your parents even more. From a housing perspective, it's, it's bleak, like it's a tough, tough go. And based on my research, but also my lived experience, that bleeds into everything else in Toronto. So if you don't have stable housing, it's super hard to get a job given the housing market and and the shortage of housing. There are also able-bodied people who are like living outside the city and making wild commutes. If you have a disability, like a commute is like going on like a Sherpa-led adventure every day. There's very little political will in Toronto to have this the public transit become like fully accessible or, or inclusive of folks with, with disabilities. Infrastructure and disability arts. The Toronto landscape is bleak. That being said, I think there is also infrastructure that a youth with a disability could really benefit from. There's a robust infrastructure of delivery services. Instacart is available. Everything is 24 hours. You have a lot more delivery things. Like there's a financial piece to this as well. But just having the, the infrastructure means that if you had typical resource, you could make this happen for yourself. The independent living community and the activist community in Toronto and the like disabled art scene in Toronto is wildly robust and super radical. So it's a great place to show up as a young person and just like learn that it's not you, it's the system. Those things are super positive and, that, and that's, that's exciting. But on a, a day-to-day thing, I, I would say that it would be very complicated to try to individuate from your parents. And like housing is like the hun Hunger Games. Community and the passage of time. Like my community made Toronto accessible in ways that like just showing up in Toronto wouldn't. As I got more community, I had more peer support in that like, if it's not accessible, we'll make it accessible sort of thing. But also it becomes like, word of mouth, like this is where you go. The shift I also found having things like 
the Access Now app, which is like a Yelp feature for accessibility, has been really fantastic. Access Maps, too. The onset of Stopgap was also fairly revolutionary for me. So Stopgap is like businesses can purchase or be gifted a portable ramp, and that really made like the hipster scene accessible. I think it also stood to some extent as like an illustration to business owners that like there are people who will frequent your space if you if they can get into it. Housing remains super disappointing. So unfortunate that Harris cut all the funding for co-ops because it was just it was such a good solution for community housing, folks with disabilities, for folk like for seniors, all of the people who end up in like weird sad places um, fit in really well to a co-op model. School system. Super interesting to me. Toronto District School Board still has a number of segregated schools or programs. Often folks who grew up in Toronto experience disability as being something othered or separate from them. I often question, I don't have any literature to like back this up, but I often question if like, the political indifference or lack of political will in Toronto to make Toronto accessible is to some extent informed by the fact that there's a school system that actively others folks who are different. Oh, I just, first of all, want to say I am loving this conversation in the chat. Um, I'm seeing some people sharing resources and community groups already, and please keep it coming. Um, This is a really great conversation. Um, I also want to say that as questions pop up, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom, that's where we'll be drawing the questions from uh, for the ends of the program. So feel free to chime in there uh, as questions come up. Um, One other thing that I'd like to bring up before moving any further is disability justice. So starting through conversations in the early 2000s between queer disabled women of color, specifically Patty Byrne, Mia Mingus, and Stacey Milburn in the San Francisco Bay Area, disability justice is a framework that connects ableism to other systems of oppression, including white supremacy, colonialism, the patriarchy, capitalism, and more. It asserts that all bodies and minds are valuable and is led by disabled people of color and queer and gender non-conforming disabled people, knowing that it's the people who are most affected by these systems that have the answers on how to move forward together. So we'll be touching a bit more on disability justice throughout this evening and mentioning it, um, but also feel free to check out some of the resources in the chat if you're interested in learning more. All right, now that we've sort of set the stage a little bit and situated ourselves with with the present day, it's time to dive into some personal stories. So first up, I'm really excited to introduce the, I mean, you'll see the bio in the chat, but a best-selling author, extraordinarily in-demand speaker and recent TikTok star, Truly, I watched through a whole bunch of the of this person's TikTok videos today. They're very good. I strongly recommend them. Um, and this person is here to share a little bit about his personal experiences navigating the city and some of the shifts that he's seen over time. So without further ado, I am very excited to welcome Spencer West. <laughs> Ophira, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. And welcome everyone. My name is Spencer West. And to just give you a brief description, I am a 40 year old cisgender gay man. I have a bald head, a salt and pepper beard. I've got clear glasses, wearing a beautiful denim jacket. And I'm sitting on a gray couch with some colored pillows behind me. Um, I also don't have any legs. So I just wanna give you a brief overview of my disability before I get into my story. So I was born with legs, but I had a genetic disease that caused the muscles in my legs not to work. So at the age of two, they were removed at the knee in hopes that I could use prosthetics. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. So then at the age of five, they were removed just below my pelvis so I could get around better. Now, I navigate the world on my hands into my wheelchair. And when I'm out and about, I use my wheelchair. And at home, I navigate about 50% walking on my hands and then about 50% in my wheelchair. 
Now, one of the privileges of my disability is that I'm able to get out of my wheelchair. And if there's a curb or maybe one or two stairs, I'm able to lift my wheelchair up the stairs myself. But one of the barriers that I face oftentimes, specifically here in the city, is accessing washrooms, which sort of leads me to my story. And we often don't hear these types of stories. So I wanted to do um, a, a bit of a, a feel-good story in regards to disability justice. So a few summers ago, a dear friend of mine named Dean was visiting from Melbourne, Australia. And we, were on, we wanted to go to dinner. And it was a Friday night. And we picked a new restaurant that had just opened in my neighborhood. And it was only about a 10 to 15 minute jaunt away. So we were going to stroll on over. And it was one of those Toronto nights where there was very little humidity. The sun was shining. There was a gentle breeze. As you were walking or strolling down the street, you could hear the laughter of people on patios. There was a little bit of electricity in the air. And of course, there was a bit of smell of sunscreen <laughs> from folks that had been in the sun all day. Now, we were going to this restaurant to have a meal. And again, as I mentioned, it was a brand new restaurant and we didn't have a reservation. So I was a little nervous. But we thought we'll go and try. So we show up to the restaurant. There was a line out the door. No problem. We were waiting in line. Eventually, we got in. We approached the podium. The person behind the podium uh, was very kind and said, do you have a reservation? And I said, no, I'm so sorry, we don't. But we, you know, we're happy to wait if, if you're able to get us in. And they said, yeah, let me take a look. And they looked down at the book that they were writing in, looked back up and said, you know, what? it'll probably only be 15 to 20 minutes if you don't mind waiting outside. To which I said, oh, my gosh, of course not. <laughs> and I looked at my friend and we were like, this is great. We thought it was going to be much longer. So we went outside, we caught up, and about 15 or 20 minutes later, they came back out and they brought us in and they brought us to our table. And inside the restaurant, it was gorgeous. It was Asian infused food. It was bright pink with gold accents and lime. And there was a black and white checkered floor. And the vibe was just, it was super energetic. And <laughs> truthfully, I sometimes don't often consider myself like one of the cool kids. But being at this restaurant, I was like, I think I've made it. I'm one of the cool kids. <laughs> so we open our menus and we're going through looking and trying to decide, you know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to drink after we eat? And it, it was taking a while for the wait staff to come over, which is no big deal. That, I'm not bothered by that at all. It was super busy. And eventually someone starts to walk towards us. And it was uh, a woman with bright red hair and she had a beautiful black flowing dress on. And she came to the table and she said, she introduced herself and she said, I'm one of the management here at the restaurant. And initially, like in my mind, everything paused. And I was like, oh no, they gave us this table. They probably shouldn't have, it's probably reserved for someone else. She's going to need us to leave. But then I thought, Spencer, you have no idea. So like <laughs> maybe just unpause and pay attention to what she's saying. So I tune back in <clears throat> and she kneels down and she looks me directly in the eye. And she says, I just have to apologize. And before I could open my mouth to be like, oh, no big deal. She said, we have an accessible washroom, <clears throat> but it's not working. And I'm really embarrassed. So I spoke to the restaurant next door to us and they have an accessible washroom and it would be no problem for you to go over and use their washroom. I'm so sorry to have to make this such an inconvenience for you, but I wanted to at least provide a solution. In my 40 years, of life on this earth, that was the first time where someone of a non-disability, and I'm only guessing, she could have had an invisible disability, I'm not sure, but that was the first time where I had felt so seen. And I, in my mind, it was the true definition of what allyship actually means. You know, again, I'm, I'm making an assumption that she was non-disabled. She saw that there was a barrier here in the city and a barrier specifically in their building, and not only did she recognize that that was a barrier for me and potentially for other people, but she also came up with a solution and then implemented that solution and offered that to me without me even having to ask. That's never happened to me before. And the reason that I wanted to tell this story this evening is because although we as folks with disabilities have to do a lot of work to advocate for ourselves, as Ophira mentioned earlier, and all of the things that we're working towards to make the city as accessible as possible, Allies are so important. 
So if there are folks on tonight that are watching that don't identify or have a disability, we still need you. We need your help. In order to make this work happen and go faster, we need every single voice, every body, every person, any way that you can communicate to lend your support to help make this city more accessible. And I think it's important for us to take the time to celebrate and recognize that allies exist. And I didn't get to thank this woman. I thanked her obviously in person, but if I could thank her in a large way, I don't know if she's on here tonight, but I just want to say thank you for what you did because that's the first time I felt seen by someone outside of my community. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I, I really strongly uh, echo echo that allyship um, is beautiful and necessary and yeah, trying, <laughs> trying to uh, rein in the feelings. And again, we're, we're just getting started. Um, into, into the, uh, into the next piece of this evening, um, we have a short film Fluid that was created by Mari Dev Ramsewak, who is a disabled and non-binary multidisciplinary artist whose incredible body of work focuses on their many intersecting identities and social justice. And I have to tell you, the first time I saw this film in particular, I knew I wanted to meet them. And this project uh, gave me the opportunity to do so. So I'm really, really excited to share this short film with you all called Fluid. <laughs> Fluid is defined as a substance that takes the shape of its container. I am always trying to fit, molding to my environment, trying to find what is safest. I am fluid. I live in a liminal space, a place of constant motion back and forth. Contained. I have always sat in the in-between. Man, woman, boy, girl, straight, gay, too disabled, not disabled enough, not Asian enough, not Caribbean enough. Trying to identify myself is like pouring water into a paper bag. I am bleeding through the edges. I am a balancing act. My body is slow, my mind is racing. I am overflowing. lucky enough to get to chat with Dev um, about this piece and about life and so many more things. And we put that into, into a video and are going to share that with you right now. Mari Dev Rumsewak, could you please give us a visual description of yourself? I am a brown person with short black and uh, pinkish reddish hair that's very short and black square glasses and a collar denim shirt. And I have no piercings. <laughs> what was the inspiration behind your short film, Fluid? I've had this idea of identifying with the word fluid for a really long time. When I was younger, it was more about my sexuality, and now it's sort of more about my gender, but also just kind of these weird in-between identities that I have kind of in a lot of different spaces. What has your experience been since releasing the film? It is such a weird thing to have out in the world and to have so many people respond to it so well. It 
helped me feel like part of the community a little bit more. What has your experience been in the realm of finding and establishing community? I grew up in the suburbs outside of Toronto. So when I first came to the actual city and university, it was really difficult for me to find a place. I found a sex ed group on campus and that's where I met a bunch of queer folks, gender queer folks, and finding people who shared sort of multiple identities with me became such a huge aspect, especially with these in-between identities as well. It's definitely been like a almost 10 year process at this point. Coming to terms with disability. Up until my 20s, a lot of my disability stuff could be dealt with behind the scenes. There was definitely a point where I was dealing with a lot of internalized ableism. Fortunately for me, that's also when I got connected to the disability community and I started to learn about what ableism was, what internalized ableism could look like, how these negative thoughts about myself could actually impact people I really cared about around me. I'm also very fortunate that I found my community when I did. And once I got on Twitter, it was a game changer. Connecting with the disability community on there was just incredible, especially other disabled queers of color. It was just like, oh, so many people could, you know, relate to my existence, like even these minute nuanced moments. What are your thoughts on disability community? It's definitely very interesting because there is a lot of community work happening, but there's also a lot of bubbles as well, especially just as the years go on. I think it's just a matter of generational gaps. Sometimes you'll just see new groups pop up doing a lot of the same work as older groups, and but you don't see them actually overlapping because they've got their bubble of community and everybody's got their bubble. I can imagine coming into it can be very daunting because it was very daunting for me. What do you hope to see in Toronto and the disability community? Yeah, I would definitely love to see more of us get connected to each other and have all of us find each other. I definitely would like to see the white disabled community push to use their connections and their privilege and to try and uplift the racialized members of our, of our community because it is it is a lot harder sometimes to the, the recognition and the credibility, even when you're doing the same amount of work. And so I just think we could hold our community to a bit of a higher standard. Final thoughts. It is really important to look to disability justice rather than just disability rights, because justice takes into account all of those things like intersectionality and putting our our most vulnerable in charge uh, and letting them come up with the ideas and and knowing that we can learn um, from those that are most impacted. It can be a lonely experience sometimes to live through my lived experiences. And when I do create this content, it reminds me that other people are living these things too. I've been very fortunate enough to meet a lot of great people who have taught me a lot and I kind of just want to help share those things that have helped me with other folks who might be going through the same thing just because it was such an important experience for me if I can do that for somebody else that's just kind of the the goal I mean I said that I'd, you know, host this event and say words and hear every time I come on, I am lost for words um, and just filled with appreciation. Um, I'm going to move into into the next story, um, which is going to be a live story, um, a live story followed by a song. And I want to just put a warning out there that the content right at the beginning um, does include a mention of assault towards the beginning of the piece. Um, And this piece is from someone that 
I kind of met in passing at a number of disability arts events. And every time I see them, it truly puts me at ease in a space because I know that, uh, that this person is there and they're just quite fantastic. Um, they are an emerging interdisciplinary theater create artist and creator, a playwright, a singer, songwriter, musician, and scholar. Um, she's in her final year of her undergraduate degree studying drama, theater, and performance studies, and also critical studies in equity and solidarity, focusing on disability studies and just just as a great human, but I will shush and stop talking so that they can come on. Um, introducing Jen Boulay. Hi, so I'm going to describe myself. I'm a Chinese woman. I am wearing a mauve sweater that says drama clean on it. And I'm wearing green and black glasses and white ear pods. And my hair is long and dark. The story that I'm going to share with you today Today is my origin story that has led to ableism within academia. On the rough, scaly surface of my skin, there are three scars. One going down the middle of my chest, stops at the top of my belly button. The other, just next to it, a smooth, milky-colored circle. The third one is a deep, hole-like scar that sits in the middle area atop my right rib. This photographic series of my body shows these scars located on bumpy, textured, skin, fish-like skin that peels off easily. In all of the photos, the complexion of my skin is a tan color. I wear a burgundy colored shirt with a gold zipper that opens in the front. The reason for so many photos is that they show different angles, focus in on particular aspects of my body. Together, these images depict the anthology of my life. Beyond the scars and skin, there lies magnificence and magnificently ugly stories. My body encapsulates several untold stories that many would never know. When I was born, I had three holes in my heart and was given only a 10% chance to, su to survive. At six weeks old, I had open heart surgery that saved my life. Unfortunately, the doctors could only patch two of the three holes, leaving me with a regurgitating leak. I had a breathing tube and a feeding tube, which resulted in scars depicted in the photographs as described above. My body, my scars, my skin was brought into the world unintentionally. My body is the product of an assault, a memory, an event, a moment not to be remembered, a body to be forgotten. It was the bodies of two people, 13-year-old twins, who through incest created the body depicted in the photos. Inevitably, I, be I came into the world and was placed into the middle of a story where I was not wanted and most definitely not expected, making this one of the ugliest stories I know to date. To continue this story a little further, I was put into the care of the Children's Aid Society and was adopted by my at the time foster parents. And at a year and a half, I was diagnosed with craniosynostosis. This meant that my skull had prematurely fused and put pressure on my brain as it began to grow against my skull, causing me to be paralyzed on my left side for two years and caused irreparable brain damage. The doctors had said that I would once again not survive. If I did, I would be a wheelchair user and have severe cognitive disabilities. However, although I am very lucky to be alive, Today, my academic life has been compromised due to the brain damage and genetic health conditions that will suddenly arise throughout my life. Throughout my time in school, during my childhood, I was in the special education program and was labeled, which led me to be infantilized by the teachers. When it came to going to university, my parents were told that I would never be accepted into university and was only college material. This absolutely shattered me into pieces. My only goal was to prove them wrong. However, on this journey, I have had to deal with systemic barriers and ableism. In an acting class, I was yelled at and threatened by my prof. They told me that they could make, take my acting card away and I didn't have to do it, but I'd be letting my scene partner down. I broke down into tears in front of them and without consent, they hugged me. At the end of the semester, they sent me a document with a summation of my work, two pages of everything I did wrong, and that me disclosing my access needs was asking to be treated special in the class. When disclosing my disabilities, a prof, they tried to get, a prof tried to guess what learning disability I had. 
they ask, is it the one where the letters turn around? Then when trying to get a note taker for me as an accommodation, they forwarded me and the note taker they found an email from my disability services advisor with all of my, all of my personal information identifying me. Another time, ask, after asking for an extension, I received an email saying that I was jeopardizing their job and livelihood and chances of getting hired at the university again. When I brought this to the attention of the disability services office, they basically said, but they gave you the extension. What do you want addressed? You might want to get documentation about the issue that, that you brought up. They gave you the details about the assignment. That should help. I'm still dealing with a lot of ableism currently. Professors and faculty and their policies just don't understand what goes on behind the scenes. I need lengthy extensions because my brain only functions as fast as a grade seven student. It takes me hours and hours to process information and understand it. It takes me about four hours to write one paragraph. My reading comprehension when timed is equivalent to a grade four student. On top of this, I'm having to deal with ever-changing medical conditions that are disruptive in my life, forcing me to take lengths of time to rest and slowly resume. And when I disclose my access needs and medical conditions, it's so I feel safe in the classroom and if something happens, people will know what to do. All of this is to say that I need people to know that I don't want them to feel sorry for me, but to understand that I'm fighting multiple battles at once and need their support. I would like them to know that this is, that I am also fighting the system and ableism that asks for documentation, documentation every time I have a medical flare up and need time to process information. I'm fighting my body and the unknown. I'm fighting my mind because I'm not living up to their standards and don't feel good enough. But they should know, but they should know that if they give me the chance to do the work with the necessary supports and accommodations, I will fight as hard as I can. I will end with an excerpt of a song that encapsulates my story, and it's called I Don't Know. Jen, thank you so incredibly much for sharing. Um, I'm seeing a lot of appreciation coming through in the chat as well. And that appreciation has been coming throughout the program uh, for all of the storytellers. I think there's a lot of very full hearts, um, mine included. So I want to take a moment to remind everyone that that Q&A button is there. If you have any questions for us, um, we'll get into the, uh, into the group discussion and Q&A at the end. So feel free, feel free to write things as they come into your mind. Um, but next up, I am going to introduce another artist um, who's sharing with us through a pre-recorded video, although this person is here, so feel free to ask those questions because she'll be able to answer them uh, in the chat afterwards. 
But this next piece is coming from Sydney Dallas. And Sydney is an artist, writer, Instagrammer, and all around delightful human. Um, with many of her own rare chronic illnesses, she's often struggled to find diagnosis and treatment and hopes that by sharing her story, she can help prevent others from suffering through the same experience. So I'm very excited to share this next piece with you all. Sydney Dallas, could you please give a visual description of yourself? I am pale, I have blonde hair around chin length. <laughs> I'm wearing glasses and a shirt with flowers on it. What do you want people to know about you? I live with my mom and my brother in Toronto. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which has a whole bunch of comorbidities as well as a sleeping disorder that I um, am working on daily. I have a lot of pets, <laughs> two cats, snakes, and snails. I like to write. I'm working on a book right now. I like digital arts. I love to paint. I like to draw. I have just learning how to sew, which is really neat. Made myself a pair of pants the other day. <laughs> Scrapbooking, anything, anything you can imagine. I really like art. It keeps me mentally healthy and it keeps me physically healthy. Is there a particular story you'd like to share? my big experience with uh, illness. Like a typical view on it would be a long stay in the hospital. I've stayed in the hospital for, I think it was 156 days straight just recently uh, for a chronic problem that we're having trouble treating. I lived there a very long time. I saw a lot of things that I did not know were happening. I've had some pretty crazy experiences. I've woken up in surgeries. I've had people pass away beside me. You know, I've made friends. I've lost friends. Uh, this has been quite the couple of years most recently. What was it like to be in the hospital for that long? It's so hard. It is so hard to be in the hospital. It is a struggle every single day. You know, you, you never have private time. Uh, or I didn't personally, I didn't have a private room. So I was living with two to four people. And those people would rotate. Probably they come in and out every, uh, weekly, usually. You really get to know the nitty gritty of the human experience. And obviously builds a lot of empathy. <laughs> You start freaking out because you're like, I know this person, I want to help them. But you're in a hospital, everybody is going to have really terrible problems and you cannot help them because you're also having some problems. That's that's hard is, is being so involved, but also trying to keep myself at a distance emotionally from all of it. How was the accessibility? Yeah, no accessibility. My bathroom door was not accessible. We ended up like tying a scarf to the handle so I could yank it around from out of my chair. And it was so small. I'm in a tiny wheelchair. And to get past my neighbor's bed, it would have to like basically put my wheel through the wall. <laughs> so I had this entire, I had a wall with a huge hole scraped across the bottom of it because there's just no space for my wheelchair. Could you create space for yourself? I had a lot of freedom personally to, to decorate. So I started decorating when a friend brought me some lights and a whole bunch of pictures. I love plants as well. So I got really into plants. My entire window was just covered with succulents. The ledge was, it was so lovely. <laughs> I kind of went ham with the decorations, but it, it, I, I was there for so long and it made it home. What were your relationships like with the people working at the hospital? The, the, I guess the staff that I saw most frequently would have been uh, the nurses, the cleaning staff and maintenance staff. They were amazing. The, they, they made my hospital experience bearable. A lot of people there that I really love and I really miss seeing every day. Uh, it was great. I had, you know, routine conversations in the morning with people and lunch convos. And, and yeah, it was really nice. It was a it was a community. How would you describe the landscape for chronic illness and disability? What would you like to see change? Like I said before, there's a whole bundle of everybody on one floor. There's a lot of trauma and stress that comes out of being around all of these problems. And 
it would be fantastic if we can get, you know, the help with all of our uh, chronic problems when we're in emergency situations. And it would also be great to, yeah, just have, just have a section for chronically ill patients where they can get full treatment. What about for youth? It's hard for people to fully understand that they could get sick they could be born with an illness or that some, that that can happen to somebody. That's very scary, especially when they're supposed to be in their prime years. Again, it would be great to have people that really work with young people with illnesses to, to give them independence. What I want to do with my experience is prevent this from happening to somebody else. That's, that's, that's what I can get out of this is help somebody avoid this problem or go through this and not feel alone. So Sydney, Sydney is here uh, and will be part of the Q&A. Um, and just to, to make a note in that video, um, a slight correction from Sydney. Um, in the video, uh, it was said that the hospital stay was 156 days, but she actually meant to say uh, that she stayed in the hospital for 652 days. Um, so putting that correction out there. Um, Moving into our last storyteller of the evening before we head into the Q&A section. Um, this is someone that I have wanted the chance to work with for so long. Uh, Steph Juniper uh, is coming up and they are a very cool human and they're going to introduce themselves before sharing a piece of their art. So Steph, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for the... Uh introduction, Ophira. I am also very happy to be working with you. Um, just to start with a visual description, I am small. I have long black hair. I have olive skin. I am wearing uh, clear glasses, frames, and blue lipstick. I am wearing a portal band t-shirt, and I have a that charm in the background of me, there are uh, some books on a bookshelf. Um, and my skin tone is like light olive. Um, my name is Steph Juniper. My pronouns are they and she. I'm a non binary, a neurodivergent performance artist, gender and disability activist. I'm a third generation white settler of Southern Italian descent. I live in the area of South Cabbage Town. Moss Park, um, in the community of uh, Toronto. Um, my disabilities are for the most part invisible. I'm working on a PhD in gender studies at York University. I am actively involved in union organizing with QB3903. I'm a lover of poetry, queer theory, outdoor leadership and education. Um, you can find me regularly on the Dawn Trail. Um, at outdoor coffee shop lineups in my neighborhood with headphones on, which is Toronto Center Area Ward 13, where I am uh, on the executive of the New Democratic Party as a member at large. I am often thinking about democracy and imagining its possibilities. The video, the video art piece that I will be showing today it was originally developed for uh, Bodies in Translation, which is a, a artistic activist type organization. Um, the piece is called Coniferous, and it's on the subject of gender and disability, as well as body image. Um, so I decided to take the approach with this video with a heavy focus on sound art because that's primarily uh, like the artistic practice that I'm involved in. Um, the visuals in this piece are mostly about uh, wil the wilderness and nature um, and are a reflection of my teenage years being in wilderness survival camp as a disabled youth, uh, which I did out in Vaughan, Ontario. I also want to mention that, um, that this video piece was filmed in Algonquin Park and that the surrounding area of the Mattawa River, River watersheds uh, 
have been part of the largest land claim in Ontario since the 1980s. And for more information, you could check out uh, the Algonquins of Ontario land claim. Since uh, this video is so heavily audio focused, I wanted to provide a bit of an audio description. Um, that's why the visuals are so minimal and mostly just show water. Um, the sound art is of my voice recorded. I'm reciting a poem with vocal effects over them uh, in combination with electric cello and bass synthesizer. Um, a sound designer friend of mine and ally uh, who goes by the name of Anthony Abatangelo. I'm gonna wait for the ASL. <laughs> Uh, supported the fine tuning of this piece. And I just wanted to say that it's it's been very important and pivotal to my experience as a disabled artist to have a non-disabled artist ally and friend of mine to support my arts practice. And I'm very happy to openly talk about that in the question and answer period. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy my piece.
Oh, such a stunning, stunning piece of art. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Steph. Um, we have officially arrived at the point of the evening, which is the Q&A. So I'm going to invite all of the storytellers to turn your cameras back on. Um, and while everyone does that, I just want to invite everyone in the audience to take a giant deep breath um, because we've been moving through an emotional roller coaster of art and stories and experiences and narratives. Um, and I can see the chat uh, wanting to catch up with, with it as well. Um, so I want to be mindful of the fact that we're a little bit uh, towards the end of the program. So we might not have tons of time or be able to address everyone's questions. Um, but looking through the Q&A, I'm seeing a theme with a lot of different questions. Um, and I think that Ahmed really sums it up well in this question of how can we find each other? Um, there's a lot of questions about how do we find other disabled folks? How do we find community? Um, and I want to throw that out to the group to see if anyone has any, any thoughts on that. Um, I'm going to ask Sydney first, if you're up for it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have had a lot of luck finding some wonderful people through Instagram, actually. Um, I do have, yeah, we have some messaging groups in there with some other uh, people with disabilities. If you, you know, if you're young and you want to talk about whatever, really, <laughs> I, I just hashtagged my disorder, which is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which affects your collagen. And it came up that a lot of people were, you know, there too. And when I got a feeding tube, I was very confused. So I looked up the hashtag of a feeding tube and with the magic of the internet, uh, I made a lot of friends. <laughs> so that was really nice. Yeah. Oh, I can strongly relate to the internet as a source of community. Um, does anyone else have some thoughts to add on just finding each other and establishing community? Not to put anyone on the spot, but if if you don't have an answer, but Jen, do you have, oh, Steph, Steph, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so since I, I, when I was a kid, I went to a pool called, um, it was now called like Hall, Holland Bloorview or something, but um, so there's been like various sorts of spaces that I've been in throughout my life where I've been, you know, to like a pool with like kids with disabilities and then in theater and finding other kids with disabilities. And then eventually in post-secondary education where I ended up joining different sorts of groups that were focused around uh, accessibility or art. Um, and currently I'm um, involved in a group called the Cyborg Circus Project, which is how I met Ophira, Ophira because of going to your play, right, with that group and Jen as well, right? So um, there's something to be said for like making art with disabled people and deaf people as a way to like come together and express ourselves. And it's also been like a really beautiful form of activism. That's the end of my thought. I love that so much. And I'm actually going to take that in segue because it was so perfect to another one of the questions in the Q&A, which is that everyone here creates in different capacities. Um, there's artists and writers and performers. And um, one of the questions is, what drives you? What drives your creation? I'm going to throw that one to Spencer. Yeah, um, this is a good question. Um, you know, for me, specifically during the pandemic, um, it, it's been hard to have that sense of community. And so by creating on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, um, 
part of what drives my my creativity is this idea that we're creating community online right now until we can potentially be in person again. Um, and so using those sorts of mediums to do that, although it feels different, um, it, and I don't think it will ever replace being the, the in-person experience. Uh, for me, I think that's helped. And the other piece is by expressing what I, what I'm learning from my disability, you're, you're sort of seeing in real time, me understanding disability justice from my perspective and how I can be in involved and how I can relate to the community around me and vice versa. And my hope is that by sharing just my genuine, honest journey, that other people will start to do the same so that it's there, there's more voices in the community. There's so many beautiful voices here tonight, but there's so many more that can be amplified. So that's what drives me for sure. That was a very good answer. Um, I'm going to see, Jen, do you have any thoughts on what drives you to create as an artist? Yeah, um, so I think for me, art is a way to express myself and to be understood. And I also just love creating art. That is the end of my thought. There's something to be said of just the... Uh just the joy of it as well. Um, Sydney. Uh, on top of what these people said, which is absolutely true, um, it helps give me a sense of accomplishment. I have a lot of time on my hands. I have a lot of time that I'm just sitting in bed um, and actually being able to do something around me and create and have something to show at the end of the day really helps. End of my thought. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I am oh, time ticking in so many questions. Um, okay, I think what I'm going to do because we're towards the end um, is that I want to give each of you a little bit of space to share any final thoughts, any things that you really wish that people knew, something that comes to your mind. Um, one of the questions is, what do you wish the general public knew about disability? But this can be about anything. You have your moments right now. Um, what, what would you like to share? And I'll start that off if anyone desperately wants to. Um, no, cool. Um, I will start that one off with Spencer. Sure. I think the thing that I would like people to know um, about disability and specifically when we look at disability justice and accessibility is that we all have to work on it together. You know, I worked on a campaign with the city council folks this year um, to reassess how we clear the sidewalks. And I think it was successful this year because for the first time, uh, non-disabled folks were using sidewalks too because of the pandemic and getting outside was so important. And suddenly this became everyone's issue. And I think when we start to look at these things as everyone's issue and that we choose to create these barriers every day and we can also choose to break down these barriers, I think that's what I would want people to know about disability is that we have the ability to, to choose whether these disappear or not. Yes, <laughs> I'm nodding my head as, a, as much as I can in a neck brace quite vigorously as an audio description for what's happening. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Steph, if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so I want to talk a minute for about um, allyship. I think that a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, whatever kind of common interests you share with people, whatever spaces you find yourself in. If you notice that someone might need a bit of help or is asking for clarification, you know, don't be shy and figure out what are some consensual ways like you can help people around you. Um, I think oftentimes what it really comes down with is, is you know, taking that, that uh, leap of faith to be kind and reach out and, and to take that risk and to see what happens because you never know, you might find yourself a new friend, a new person to make art with, someone to start a revolution with. So yeah, that's my thought. I love that so much, so much. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Jen. Do you, are you ready for, for, the, for the question? Yes. Um, so I guess 
Um, I'm thinking about uh, having people listen when we are sharing or disclosing um, our access needs and not jumping to conclusions before we explain something or assuming uh, something about disability. Um, and also that disabled people are people. Um, that's the end of my thought. I feel like there probably are, but if there aren't, there should be t-shirts. Um, I would buy one that says disabled people are people. Uh, just, just FYI um, for the world to know. Amazing. Last but not least, Sydney. Okay, so um, I'm... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, just for able-bodied people, if you know somebody that is having troubles, if you know somebody that's in the hospital, they're probably having a really hard time doing the basic things, day-to-day -day stuff, you know, um, and if you offer your services, no matter how small that is, it will be appreciated. Also, visit your grandma in the hospital. She needs you. And for those with you know chronic illnesses or stuff they're dealing with be sure to push for accessibility and that doesn't just mean like physical accessibility um if you're only alert at certain type times of the day and your doctor's saying oh well i like being up in the morning you you push for that push for sedation if you need sedation for things that you're not normally sedated for you know um if you're not a uh, comfortable in public places, push for video conversations. Be sure to keep pushing because unfortunately, often there is a pushback or it's just brushed over because a lot of people don't go through the same experiences that we have. So uh, be loud and stubborn. <laughs> I love that as well. I feel like sort of this common theme of communication, being loud, taking up that space where you can, but also finding the people. Um, and really, I guess right now we're, we're putting it out there to folks um, to join, to join up, to, to make some noise and, and help create that space um, with communication and listening and consent, uh, most of all. I follow all of these people on the social medias the social medias. I'm a youth too, I promise. Um, the links were shared in the chat and everything that was shared in the chat, those resources will also be emailed to you afterwards. So um, really, truly, and also of the storytellers, the folks who couldn't make it tonight, uh, Sam Walsh and Mari Dev Ramsey Walk, definitely keep up with their work as well. Um, I would like to give the biggest thank you um, to quite simply everyone, um, but to the storytellers tonight, um, to Real Abilities and the MNGCC and Deaf Spectrum and Myzeum for really, I mean, if you are keeping up in the chat, extraordinary, extraordinary work. Um, and to everyone who watched and shared, I it means so much to carve out the space for these stories. Um, we don't have enough of it. And I hope that this two-part series is just the start. Um, and I'm really, really excited for more of these events to be taking place in the future. So thank you all so much. And I'm going to pass it back to the incredible Nadine and I'll, I'll shush because, you know, now I'm getting too emotional, but thank you so much. Thank you, Ophira. Um, I, I would just like to express our deepest gratitude to our storytellers this evening, Jen, Mari, Sam, Sydney, Spencer, and Steph. Um, I think to share one story um, is such a meaningful act of generosity um, in any context, um, but, but particularly within the context of this program tonight, infinitely so. Um, so uh, just such a heartfelt thank you. Um, thank you to Ophira for bringing together such compelling stories and storytellers um, for moderating this event and just for being such a wonderful spirit overall to work with. We just loved um, working with you on this program over all these months. Um, I owe such a huge debt to Liv Mendelssohn um, at Real Abilities Film Festival and um, Miles Nadal JCC. Um, just 
quite literally for making this program possible, for jumping at the chance to to finally be able to partner. I, I, I we've been, I, you know, um, kind of. Um, bumping up against each other in different contexts and really wanting to partner. So thank you so much, Liv. And, and as well to Grace at Real Abilities for helping um, coordinate so many logistics around this program. Uh, thank you to Deaf Spectrum, our promotional partners. Um, thank you to our ASL interpreters and live captioner uh, tonight. Um, a very special thank you uh, from me to our very hardworking Mizeme staff who just move mountains um, with their dedication and their commitment to what we do. Thank you all for coming. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed tonight's program and I hope you'll join us. Um, we have coming up in April, our Intersections Festival, which will be held mostly digitally this year. Um, and this is our annual festival that explores the intersectional perspectives of Toronto. Um, you can go to our website at myzeumoftoronto.com or sign up for our newsletter um, to stay up to date on all of our programming. Um, and uh, thank you again for coming. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>